Good morning. Oh, the cold weather's got everybody under the weather this morning, doesn't it? Still got a lot of a lot of people with the sniffles, but it's sure glad to see you here. This year, God wants to give you a new start. Refuse to let your past rob you of your future. Let's face it, we all have relationships that can't be healed and issues that will never be resolved to our liking. But by God's grace, we can start this new year out by forgiving, forgetting, and moving on. You don't have to lay awake at night digging up the old ghost, picking at the scars, and reviving painful memories. Don't think about them. Let them go. If you give them an opening, the ghost of your past will take up residence in your head. You say, but I still struggle in so many areas. We all do. Even the great apostle Paul admitted he did not have it all together. In Romans 7, Paul admits, I know the law, but can't keep it. Sin keeps sabotaging my best intentions. I need help. I decide to do good, but my decisions don't result in action. Something gets the better of me every time. Sound familiar? Well, I'm so thankful for Paul who wrote that because those of us who mistakenly thought that becoming a Christian was a free ticket and there would be no more tr troubles or struggles, Paul kind of set that clear. In Philippians 4, Paul wrote Philippians also, and it says, Don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers, letting God know your concerns. Before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good, will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. You can get power and you can get victory, extra power, extra victory during this time of prayer and fasting. Prayer is marvelous, but when you add fasting with it, fasting is that turbo boost, Paul. It's that extra oomph that helps you to get those prayers answered, helps you get those problems resolved that don't normally get resolved. If you started fasting Tuesday, great. If you didn't, start today. If you can't start today, you got something going, start tomorrow. Tomorrow's Monday. Monday's a horrible anyhow, so you may as well add fasting on top of it. But do something. Do something for the Lord. And in so doing, you will see God move mightily on your behalf. I've seen it many, many times, brothers and sisters. He loves to do that, to show himself mighty. But you've got to do your part, too, in prayer and fasting. So I encourage you to do a something, anything for the Lord. Let's pray. Father, help us as we enter into this time of prayer and fasting. Your word says as we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. Help us to strengthen our inner man in the power of Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. Let's greet one another.
Praise the Lord. You can be seated. Hallelujah. God is good. Amen. I don't know if, uh, if you've dealt with this uh, thing going around or not. As some of you are using Kleenexes, and I've heard a few coughs. I'm sure some people have been. Colin's taking a swig of water so he don't cough. And, and uh, pray for me because I could have a coughing fit again this morning. Amen. I, I told a few earlier that it's been exactly a month uh, as of, I think, tomorrow or, 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 or uh, Tuesday that I first got whatever this junk is. And uh, I heard that it was called the 100-day cough. I rebuke that. Amen? I don't want this for 100 days. Do you? Absolutely not. Praise the Lord. We're just going to serve God anyway. We're going to pray for those that are unable to be here. Uh, I know that several people are dealing with it, and glory to God, we're going to get through it, amen? Hallelujah, we're going to get through it. Uh, just a few announcements this morning, of course, uh, fasting began on the 2nd, last Tuesday, and so I hope that you have jumped on board. Now, I'll tell you something I've noticed. I've been sharing this with my family because normally fasting is, it, I get in the mode of fasting because we've done it so long. Uh, after Christmas. As soon as Christmas is over, I can't hardly even eat all the leftovers that we have. And, and, I, and I start getting in that mode of wanting to fast. And normally, I will do a, a fast, and I'm sharing this because I know people have a lot of questions about fasting sometimes. But normally, what I will do is I will, have, I will do like a liquid fast. I'll drink some juice and, and, and things like that, you know, and, and of course, water. You drink a lot of water when you're fasting. Amen. It's, it's a must. And normally I can do that, and I can, I can trek on through, and maybe the last week I might have to start adding a meal a day or a meal every other day, depending on how active I am. Amen? Well, I've noticed with being sick, I made it three days before I had to finally eat a meal. I mean, I was about to just hit the floor. And so I, I told Angel, I said, it's got to be from being sick because normally I don't, I don't have this much trouble fasting. So, so if you've dealt with this, this illness that's going around and you find yourself struggling with fasting, listen, just, just adjust a little bit. Amen. Adjust a little bit and continue. Amen. Uh, you know, I say this a lot, but <clears throat> fasting is, is not about uh, thinking that God's going to strike you down if you eat something. It, it's not about that. Fasting is about being committed to the Lord, amen, and, and just trying to, to, to make your flesh a little bit weaker so your spirit can be a little bit stronger, amen. It, it, it's about being committed. It, it's about trusting the Lord, amen. It's crying out to him with prayer and fasting. Jesus tells us that some things only come by prayer and and fasting, amen, fasting is important, and, and so I encourage you to jump on board, to fast, uh, and, and do what you can, amen, but most importantly, pray, most importantly, pray, so that began on the 2nd, we'll go through the 23rd uh, with prayer and fasting, uh, our annual business meeting will be on the 21st of January, those that were selected to be on the nominating committee, would you stand up, Kara's behind me, she's already standing up, you too, Stand up. These are the ones that y'all selected last week to be on the nominating committee. If you have a question or if you have someone that you would like to see serve on the board for the next year, uh, please see them. Amen. That's their job is to help me with uh, nominating those that will be uh, serving or that will be on the ballot for the business meeting. So y'all can sit down. Thank you all. And uh, not you. You stay standing. And uh, so... Uh, uh, but uh, if you all could meet with me just for a few moments right after service, won't take five minutes probably, and, and we can discuss a few things. And uh, let's see. Uh, don't forget Friday morning Bible study, as long as everybody's well. Amen. They plan to be there this week. Praise the Lord. Amen. And we plan to have Wednesday night Bible study this week, Romans chapter 12. Um, it's just been a little bit of a struggle. I knew there wouldn't be a whole lot of people here, and I knew that that I was having a hard time getting through uh, a few sentences without coughing anyhow. And so, uh, so we postponed. But uh, celebrate recovery every Friday at 7. And uh, you shared last week, I believe it was, about the, the Bible drive, I want to call it. The Bible drive for the ladies in the jail that you're all ministering to. Um, I heard report that some may be getting baptized, hopefully. You're working on it. Working on it. Amen. 
Well, that will be so amazing, and I hope that gets to take place. And uh, but there, the these these ladies are needing some Bibles, and uh, she presented it to the church. How much were the Bibles? Did you say fifteen dollars each? How many women do you have? Okay, nine, nine women needing needing Bibles, fifteen dollars a piece. So if you want to sponsor one of these ladies and help them with a Bible, please see Eileen and and help take care of that. Yes, ma'am. Praise the Lord. If you want to give uh, to, to the Bible Drive, there's a drop-down online for Celebrate Recovery if you want to give online, so you can do it that way as well. Praise the Lord. One other thing uh, that I wanted to mention, there's been several people talk to me about an interest in Kentucky School of Ministry. Uh, it's an it's a, it's a, a educational program through um, the Assemblies of God. They do it at Crestwood at the, head, at the, uh, the K- Kentucky AG headquarters, and uh, it's called KSOM or Kentucky School of Ministry. And I have a booklet here that's got all the information about those courses. They do one course a month. And there's three levels to, those, uh, to that uh, school. And so if you're interested, you can see me, and I'll, I'll help explain it. And, but also, this will be on the back table over there. If you are interested, you know, it's, it's the, the school that you go through to do your credentialing process to be a pastor or a ministry leader in, in, in that capacity to have credentials. You don't have to take the credentials. You can get like a certificate of biblical study or something like that if you're interested. Amen. So I wanted to share that because several people have mentioned that to me, and they've already started. There will be, a, I think there's a class next week, so you've missed that. If you want to hit the February class, you still have time, and this will be on the back table. Amen. That's all of the announcements that I know of. Um, if our ushers are ready. We'll take up our Sunday morning tithes and offerings. <clears throat> oh, I thought y'all was trying to get my attention. Oh, by the way, it's Justin's birthday today. Amen. He turned 36 today. No, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. He's quite a bit younger than that. And uh, so make sure you wish him happy birthday. I would sing him happy birthday, but y'all would laugh at me. Do it. Not happening. We'll sing with Not you. Happening. We'll sing with you. Okay. You, you all start. Happy and birthday to you. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Happy birthday, dear J Dog. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. you. <laughs> and many more. Amen. Brother Colin, would you pray over the offering this morning?
out the elements of communion prepare to take the Lord's Supper together. Our ushers who are going to help me with that meet me at the table.
Once a month, we come together and we take communion together as a church family. We're commanded to do this. Amen. We're commanded to do this together to, um, to commemorate the, the Lord's sacrifice, to remember what he's done, to, to remember what is going to take place. Amen. To reflect and to look forward. The definition of communion is, is this. It's a close relationship with someone in which feelings and thoughts are exchanged. That's the worldly definition of the word. word. Communion, when we, when we do this, we're not only communing together as a family, but we are communing with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Communion is significant in that we are remembering His sacrifice. We're looking forward to to his soon coming. Uh, It's significant in that it reflects our relationship with him. Amen. We we take of of these elements because it reflects our relationship with him. It represents the body and the blood of Christ. Amen. It reflects our faith in Christ. Amen. It reflects our commitment to him and that we do this regularly. During this time of prayer and fasting, I would encourage you to... You know, because we do this together as a family, but we can do this separate as well. Amen? I encourage you during this time of fasting to take a time of private communion with the Lord. Don't worry. It's not breaking your fast. Amen? But but it's an important thing. You You can take communion as often as you would like. He says, as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Amen? So I encourage you through this time of prayer and fasting... Take time, have communion with just you and Jesus, amen? Have that time, that quality time, that private time, amen? It's important. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul writes about the Lord's Supper. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, it reads, For I received from the Lord what I also passed unto you, The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. He said, This is my body which is broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. In like manner, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Lord, we thank you for your broken body. We thank you, Lord God, for the stripes upon your back. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for the wounds that you suffered in our place. We thank you for your blood that was spilled out upon Calvary for the remission of sin. We thank you for your forgiveness. And we give you praise because you are worthy of our praise. In your precious name. Lead us in a song for a few moments. Let's just worship him a few more moments as they lead us in this song. If you want to stand, you can stand. If you want to sit, you can sit. If you want to kneel, you can kneel. If you want to raise your hands, you can raise your hands. If you want to dance, you can dance. Let's just worship the Lord together for a few more moments. Amen.
you adore him this morning? Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand. Hallelujah. We serve a good God today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your love and your mercy. Hallelujah. Lord, we give you praise. We give you praise today, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can be seated. God bless you, worship team. Thank you, guys. Uh, Children's Church are dismissed. Thank you all as well. One thing I forgot to mention during announcements, uh, there has been a few people interested in joining the church. Uh, if you're not a member and you want to join the church, then please let me know, and we will we will get that taken care of. Amen. So just just uh, I think there's a slide that come across that comes across. If you are interested in joining the church, see the pastor. Amen. So not right now. We'll wait till after service, but but just let me know, and uh, we will we will get moving forward with that. Amen. Um, praise the Lord. I wonder have you ever asked God why. I'm sure we all have at times. Why, God? Why? I mean, that, that is our question that we come to him with. Why? Why, why, why me? Why now? Why, why is this happening? I'm sure we've said that plenty of times. Why is this happening, God? And why am I here? What is my purpose? I'm sure many of us have asked God why. You know, God doesn't do anything by chance. Unlike us, God doesn't do anything on a whim. He doesn't just, uh, uh, you know, just go with the flow. God has a purpose. Amen? Uh, our previous pastor, Brother Mike, he's preaching in Radcliffe today, and he's feeling under the weather, so please be praying for him. Let's pray for him right now. Father, we pray for Brother Mike. Lord, I pray that you give him favor. Lord God, as, as he's preaching this morning, I pray, Lord God, that in the church that he's in, Lord God, today, Lord God, that souls will be saved. God, I pray that you use him, you anoint him, you minister to the people there. And God, we thank you for it. And I pray that you help him to get through, that you heal him. Lord God, that he doesn't have to cough or, or any of those things while he's preaching, Lord God. I pray that you completely, 100% heal him this morning, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. But our previous pastor, he had the habit of just uh, going with the flow with certain things. I've told you this probably before. We went to the Derby one time to preach, and we drove the church van, and we get all the way down there, and we realize, or I realize, he pretty much already knew, that the church van was out of gas. It, it, the light was on, and this thing was a gas hog. And so... We get back in the van at the end of the day, and we're about to head home. And I said, uh, Brother Mike, I see the lights on. He said, yeah, I wonder if we can make it all the way back to the church. I said, are you serious? He said, well, yeah. That's why I didn't put any in it. I want to see if we can make it. <clears throat> I said, did you plan this? No. No, we're just going to go with it. I said, I don't like just going with it. I would rather, I mean, there's a gas station right up the street. Let's get some gas. No. Nope. It's all downhill from here. We'll make it. We made it. But I did not think we would. I figured we'd be walking somewhere, you know. But, but he, he's always uh, the comedian, and he, uh, he will go with the flow, believe me. I've been on plenty of trips. But God's not like that. Amen? <coughs> Excuse me. God does not just go with the flow. Everything has a purpose. Amen? Especially you. Especially you. You have a purpose. Amen. You have a purpose here in this life. You have a purpose here in this church. Amen. God has a purpose for you. I wonder if you've ever wondered, am I here for a reason? Do I have a purpose? Rest assured, you absolutely do. Amen. Absolutely you do. The Apostle Paul tells us in Colossians chapter 4 verse 5 to uh, take advantage or to make the most of every opportunity. Amen. And we should. We should make the most of every opportunity that God gives us. Amen? Everyone, every one of us is presented with opportunities, many different types of opportunities throughout life. Amen? Opportunities to love, opportunities to laugh, opportunities to give, opportunities to help, and opportunities to make a difference. We're all presented with opportunities like that. Amen? 
And the Apostle Paul tells us to, take, to make the most of those opportunities. Now, in order to make the most of every opportunity, we must be able to recognize those opportunities. Amen? So that we don't miss them. So we don't miss the things that God is putting before us, those opportunities. we got to be able to recognize them. I'm sure everybody here has heard the statement, live in the moment. Or be present. Live in the moment. Be present. I don't know what that might mean to you, but, you know, don't we all live in moments of time? We do. We all live in moments of time. We live in a world that is centered around time, is it not? Everything is dictated by time. If I were to ask you to explain time, you would explain it in seconds, minutes, hours, days, months, years, and so on. Because when we think of time, that's what we think. A measurement. Amen? And we would be absolutely correct. You would be correct if you explained time to me in that way. But the ancient Greeks, they looked at time much differently than you and I do. They looked at it much differently, so much so that they had two different words that they used for time. One is chronos, is a Greek word for time. The other is kairos, not chaos, but kairos. Some of us, when we think of time and, and the way our life is, we would think, well, yeah, chaos would fit. But that's not the word, it's kairos, amen? Two words used for time. You may recognize the word chronos, where we get, that's where we get our English word chronology from chronos. It's time measured, amen? The way you and I generally look at time, it's measured, amen? Minutes, seconds, hours, days, so on. History is measured in chronological order. Everything has a measurement. Everything is in order, amen? Chronology. Kairos, on the other hand, this other Greek word for, <coughs> for time is a word which we have no English translation other than time. So if you find the word chronos in, 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 in the, the, the Bible, it, you're gonna, it's going to be translated as time. If you find the word kairos in the Bible, it's going to be translated as time. Because we don't have a word to, distri- to describe kairos. There was no English word that could describe all that it pertained to. This word is used to describe a different way of looking at time than the measurement of time. This time is not measured in minutes, but in experience. Kairos is the measurement of a particular moment in time rather than its duration. As I was studying this out, I seen someone explaining this, and they had a graph. And they had a graph of, of Kronos, and it was one-hour blocks. But then below it, it had kairos, and there was one-hour blocks, and all of a sudden, there was one large block that said kairos, and then it went back to one-hour blocks. That's a good description of the word kairos and what it means, because it's not a measurement of time, but it is confined within time. It is a specific moment. It is an important moment, amen? This word describes meaningful moments, purposeful, impactful moments, such as the birth of a child. Such as the moment that you give your life to Christ. When you first hear the gospel and it, and it clicks and you give your life to Christ, that is kairos. It is a moment. It cannot be measured in time, but it is a moment within time. Amen? And an important moment. Jesus used this, this word, kairos. Kairos. When he, when he come into Jerusalem in his final week of ministry, just before he was to die, he come into Jerusalem and he overlooked Jerusalem and he used this word in a statement that he made about the people of Israel. I'm going to show you that. Um, I'm just going to read it to you. You can turn there if you would like. It's Luke chapter 19 verse 41. This is not our main text. This is just setting the stage for the main text. In Luke chapter 19 verse 41, Jesus said this. He says, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. And said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, <clears throat> but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. 
They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the kairos, time, of God's coming to you. That's the word he used there. You did not recognize the kairos, the time, of God's coming to you. Jesus spoke here of a time, an opportunity missed. Amen? An opportunity missed by the Jewish people. Jesus came and left, and they missed who he was. Kairos. A time within time. And an impactful time. An opportunity. Jesus, in 33 and a half years, is Kairos. That moment. Specifically, three and a half years of ministry that he spent here on earth, and they missed him. Kairos. Not measured in minutes, not measured in hours, but measured in experience, measured in a moment, measured in an opportunity. You know, defining moments are captured opportunities. Defining moments are captured opportunities. They are not uh, moments, chronos, measured time. They are kairos. Amen? They are kairos. They're specific times. Moments in the timeline uh, uh, of eternity. Pauses in the timeline. That's kairos. Amen? I want to share with you this morning about a young woman who came uh, close to missing an opportunity. Because she lived in the moment, Kronos, rather than living in Kairos. Amen? She lived in that moment rather than living in that Kairos, that specific moment. Look with me, if you will, in Esther chapter 4. Esther chapter 4. Many of you already know where I'm going when I say Esther chapter 4. And I was thinking about this, and I was going over the things I would say, and I, and I was thinking about turning to Esther. I said, turn to Mordecai, chapter 4. <laughs> but I almost done that this morning. But uh, turn to Esther, chapter 4, and if you will, stand with me for the reading of the Word of God this morning. <clears throat> Hold your Bibles in there and repeat after me. I believe this is the Word of God. I believe it's the absolute truth. I believe it's inspired of the Holy Ghost. And I believe I can pattern my life after it. Verse 1, it says, When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, he put on sackcloth and ashes, he went out into the city wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province, in province to which the edict and, the, and, and order of the king came, there, were, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. And when Esther's eunuchs and, and, and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of the sackcloth, but he, wouldn't, he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, assigned to her, <clears throat> and, summoned, uh, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai <clears throat> and why. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including uh, the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their, for their annihilation which had been published in Susa, to show to Esther and explain it to her. And he told him to instruct her to go into the king's presence and beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Athic went back and reported to Esther uh, what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, all the king's officials and all the people of the royal provinces uh, know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner courts without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends his gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all, Jew, of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you 
and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come into your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. Father, I pray that you anoint me to preach your word this morning. And I pray, God, that your message is uh, revealed to your people. God, I pray that it speaks to their hearts, that it speaks to their minds. Lord, I pray that you help us to apply this word to our life, to understand how to live, to understand how to take uh, uh, make the most of every moment, of every opportunity given to us, Lord God. Help us, Lord God, to understand what it means to live in the kairos rather than a slave to the chronos. And Father, I pray, God, that you speak to our hearts, and I pray that you anoint me and heal me, God, in your precious name. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. So the setting of this story is in Persia, uh, which you would know, recognize as modern-day Iran. And uh, the Jews were in Persia because uh, initially they were uh, taken captive by Babylon and brought into Babylon, and then later uh, the Persians took over Babylon, and, and then eventually they allowed many of the Jews to go back home, but some of them chose to stay. These are the Jews that we're reading about here. Mordecai and the Jewish people in Persia chose to stay behind for whatever reason. And that, that's not the, the... If we was doing a Bible study on Esther, we'd go a lot deeper than that. But, but that's not for this uh, message this morning. But the king of Persia honored a man named Haman. You, you, you've seen that when we was reading this. The man Haman was mentioned about this edict that he had come up with, this law. And... Uh, and, and this man, Haman, was, was honored by the king, and he was given authority, amen, authority to rule within the kingdom. And so, because of his position, the people were expected to bow at his feet. They were expected to pay him honor. Well, Mordecai, a Jewish man, wouldn't do that. Now, there's a lot of debate on why Mordecai wouldn't bow or, or, or kneel at the feet of of Haman and giving him honor. Some say, well, it didn't have nothing to do with, with you know, it being worshipped to him. It could be because of Haman's heritage. Whatever the reason, he still wouldn't do it. I would, I would be led to believe because of this story that it was more so that he intended that to be worship and he didn't want to do that. Amen? So Mordecai wouldn't do it. So Haman was angry. And he devised a plan to kill Mordecai. But he wasn't satisfied with just Mordecai because he found out Mordecai was a Jew. And that's why he wouldn't kneel. And so he devised the plan to annihilate all of the Jews in Persia. Now that seems horrific. Many of us, uh, most of us aren't old enough to remember the Holocaust. But we know from history the things that took place in Germany. Now I'm going to tell you, if this plan would have played out, it would have been far worse than the Holocaust. There was approximately 15 million Jews in Persia at this time. And they was all to be annihilated at one time, in one day. Money was set aside to pay for this. Everyone would have had a right to take the life of a Jewish person. It seems horrific, amen? But if we know anything about history, we know that that mindset is even in the minds of people not too long ago. Amen? A horrific thing, an evil thing. So Haman devised this plan to annihilate the Jews. And he presented this plan to the king. And the king trusted Haman. He didn't really look into it. He was kind of like an absent-minded king. He just, you know, kind of like the president that we have now. And he was kind of absent-minded. I shouldn't say that, but it's the truth. And I'm supposed to speak the truth from the pulpit, you know. So anyway, I better get back to where I should be. That was not in my notes, by the way. It just come to mind. <laughs> so anyway, um, Mordecai devised, it, devised this plan, and he wanted to annihilate the Jews. And the king signed off on it, so it had authority. And in just a few short months, a day was set that this was going to take place. So Mordecai and the rest of the Jews began to mourn. 
This was customary among the Jews. When they, when they was going through a time of mourning, they'd put on sackcloth and ashes and, 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 and weep and cry and wail out of sorrow. Amen? This wasn't an uncommon thing. So Mordecai had a cousin, a young girl. Her parents had passed away and she was left as an orphan. And he took her, adopted her, and she became his daughter. And you know her as Esther. She's the queen now. So Mordecai is out there in sackcloth and in ashes, weeping and wailing, hoping to get somebody's attention. And as you've seen in the story, Mordecai presents the problem of Haman's law, I'll call it, to the queen by her servants, asking her to do something about this. Now, although Esther and Mordecai, they live in the same province, they, they're, they're related. I mean, he, he's technically her father, and, and they have this relationship. But although they live close, although they are related, they live in two completely different worlds. Amen? You know that in society, we can live in two completely different worlds? Well, our world may be in a certain way, but there may be somebody else, and their world is completely different than ours. And sometimes it's hard for us to understand. Amen? Esther was royalty. She was groomed to be the queen. This young woman was selected for, for an ancient version of the bachelorette. She was taken as, as a group of young ladies because the king was angry with his queen. He, be, he, he had uh, invited her to come into his presence, and she wouldn't do it. So he said, enough with you. I'm done. And so she couldn't come into the king's presence no more. She was no longer the queen. So he needed a queen. So he gets all these young ladies together, and they go through all these beautification treatments and all this training and different things. And then they're presented before the king. And when the king looked upon these young ladies and he saw Esther, this young Jewish girl, there was no doubt she was the queen. It was love at first sight, or whatever it was. But, but she was going to be the queen, amen? And so he has selected her. Everything in Esther's life was good. She was well-fed, she was well-clothed, she had a mansion for a home. There was no end to her wealth. She was a real-life Cinderella, probably down to the glass slippers. I mean, that, that's really a Cinderella story, is it not? Mordecai, on the other hand, he was overlooked. There was a plan to assassinate the king. Mordecai found out about it, warned the king. Never was rewarded for it. You read about it later in the book. You find out that he was. But at, at this time, he had never been recognized for saving the king's life. He was overlooked. He was rejected by many for being a Jew. He was hated by Haman and others. He was convicted and sentenced to death with this edict, this Haman's law. His whole world was caving in around him. You see the difference in the two worlds? How could the queen not know what was taking place? How could she not know what was going on in the kingdom? Everyone else knew what was going on, but the queen was unaware. When she heard of how Mordecai was acting in the city in sackcloth and ashes, she sent him clothes. Here, put this on. Why are you acting this way? Put on new clothes. Don't walk around like this. It wasn't something that the Persians did. It was only something that the Jews did. I'm sure much of the queen's concern was that Mordecai was bringing attention to himself, which would in turn possibly bring attention to her. You see, the relationship between her and Mordecai and the fact that she was a Jew was withheld from the king. He didn't know. He didn't know she was of Jewish descent, and he did not know that Mordecai was her adopted father. So you could see that her concern, because of her newfound position, is, Mordecai, what are you doing? You're like out in public doing this. Why would you do this? And now, you know, you're, you're going to end up bringing attention to me, and the secret's going to be out. I mean, that could have been what was going through her mind. The queen's actions of giving Mordecai these clothes was like putting a Band-Aid on a compound fracture. Can you imagine a bone sticking out of your leg and you put a Band-Aid on it? I mean, that would be just ignorant, to say the least. All it's going to do is cover up a major problem. And by her sending clothes to Mordecai, all it was was a Band-Aid. 
Hey, put these clothes on so nobody sees what's really going on. Putting a band-aid on the problem. Sometimes we mistakenly offer the gospel, offer a prayer as a band-aid. Now bear with me, I want to explain what I'm trying to say because that could be taken the wrong way. When someone is hurting or in pain, physically or emotionally, we many times tell them about Jesus. We share a scripture. We offer a prayer that we intend to pray later. And then we leave without real concern for the problem. Real concern, without real concern for their issue. I say that because, you know, if somebody's in the hospital, if somebody's in, in, in a bad way, maybe they've went through a divorce, they've lost their home, they lost their job, whatever it may be. Many times, we as believers, that's simply what we do. We say something like, well, just, just trust in the Lord. He will answer every question that you have. He is the answer. He, he will supply your needs. And we'll say something like that. And it's the truth. Amen? Or we'll say, well, I'll pray for you. But you don't intend to pray right then because your chronos, your time, confines you. You don't have time. And we say, yeah, I'll pray. And guess what? Days go by. And you think about that person. You're like, oh, I never did pray for them. Many times we offer the gospel. We may send them a little card with a scripture on it. Or we may share a scripture with them in their time of need. And many times it's because we, we really don't have a lot of concern for their problem. It's just that we want to say something. We want to offer something as a band-aid. Rather than being focused on the real problem at hand. It's kind of like if we were to throw a, a piece of wood to a drowning man. Here, I hope this helps without ever intending to help them get to shore. That's what we do many times. Amen? That's what Esther was doing when she gave clothes to Mordecai. Now we know that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Amen? Unto salvation to, those, to, to everyone who believes. It's the power of God unto salvation. We know that. The, 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 the gospel message is powerful, there's no doubt. The word of God never returns void. There's no doubt. But let me tell you this. The gospel is powerful in saving of souls, but it is also powerful in saving of lives. And what I mean by that is this. The gospel is more than a message of words. It is a message of action. Think about the history of the church. The history of believers in Christ. It's where hospitals came from. College campuses were not always liberal. It began with the church. Hospitals, orphanages, all of these things to care for the needs of others began with the church. The gospel message is more than words. It is a message of action. Amen? It's a message of action. For example, it's hard for someone to hear the gospel message when they're starving. So what do we do? We feed them. Amen? We feed them. I've heard so many people say, why do we send money to kids in Africa that are starving? How do you expect to tell them about Jesus if you don't feed their hungry bodies? You talk to any missionary that's out on the mission field. Their focus first is on the needs of the people so that they can share the gospel with them. Because then they'll listen. It's hard to... For someone to hear the gospel message when they're freezing. So we offer them warm clothes and a, some shelter. It's very hard for someone to hear that Christ is the living water when they're dying of thirst. So what do we do? We give them clean water. That's what the church does. Amen? The body of Christ. That's what we should do. The quickest way to the heart is to first help with the need. Esther wasn't doing that. Esther was throwing a band-aid to Mordecai. Here, put on some clothes. Quit making a scene, Mordecai. Put something on, man. What are you thinking? 
That was basically what she was doing. Mordecai needed saving. Mordecai didn't need a pacifier. He didn't need a band-aid. He needed saving. He needed someone to hear him. He needed someone to hear his cry for help. Church, we need to hear people's cries for help. Amen? We need to hear it. Advocating for the needs of others often requires us to step out of our comfort zone. Well, that's where the rubber really meets the road when we got to step out of our comfort zone. Mordecai explains to Esther his dilemma and he offers a solution. He suggests that no longer can her heritage be a secret. No longer can she keep it to herself that she must go to the king. She must beg. Uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me. She must beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Her people. See, she had to have a change in her mindset. No longer was it just her world. Now it needs to be her people that she's concerned with. This is where it gets very difficult for Esther. This request of Mordecai would put Esther at risk of not only losing everything that she had, all of her possessions, all of this wealth, but, but, but possibly even her life. So her response is really, I can't. I can't do it. I mean, put yourself in her shoes for a minute. We're we thinking about Mordecai and all the things that he's going through and feeling his pain and understanding the problems of people without throwing them a Band-Aid, but understanding someone's problems, putting ourselves in their shoes. Well, let's put ourselves in the shoes of Esther for just a moment. If anyone should get a pass, don't you think it should be Esther? If anyone is entitled... To get a pass, it, it should be Esther. I mean, she's already had it hard enough in her life. She was orphaned as a child. She grew up uh, without her parents. She was adopted by her cousin. She had to live most of her life looked down on in a foreign land as a Jew. She'd had a rough time. I don't know how many in here grew up without their parents that was orphaned or, or not, but that's a hard life to live, Amen. And she lived it way back in ancient history in a foreign land, a Persian empire. She had finally gotten her breakthrough. No longer was she looked down upon. Uh, it was her time to shine. Amen? She was queen. Selected out of all the young ladies in Susa. She's the queen. She had power. She had wealth. She had beauty. She had fame. She was Cinderella in the flesh. Why, Mordecai? Why would you ask this of me? Why? I finally got my break. I finally have everything I've always wanted. Why? Why would you ask me to risk it all? Her response to Mordecai was basically, not only is this impossible, but it's illegal. She said, nobody can go before the king without being invited. He has one law. And that's if he don't hold out the scepter, then you will be put to death. She said it's illegal. You know, just because something is legal doesn't make it right. It's legal to go out in the drink and get plastered. Does that make it right? No. That's unbecoming of a, of a believer in Christ. If you go to Las Vegas on vacation, prostitution is legal. Does that mean you should participate? Absolutely not. Some states allow for the smoking of marijuana and other drug use. Does that make it okay? Absolutely not for the Bible-believing Christian. Absolutely not. In this case, the murder of the Jews was going to be legal in a few short months. And everyone would have the right to take the life of one of the Jews in Persia. Does that make it right? No. No. Just because something's legal doesn't make it okay. If it was illegal to preach the gospel, if it was illegal to speak in the name of Christ, I would still do it, wouldn't you? Absolutely. I would almost be excited. Don't tell me I can't talk about Jesus. Because I'm going to do it anyhow. Don't tell me I can't preach the truth of God's word because I'm going to do it anyhow. Peter and John was presented with that dilemma. 
They was told, you can't speak in the name of Jesus. And they're like, I can't help it. I can't help but talk about him. He saved me. He brought salvation to all of mankind. He died on the cross for our sins. I can't help but talk about him. It doesn't matter if it's illegal or not. Esther had forgotten who she was. Not that she had forgotten that she was the queen. She forgot that she was a Jew. And she had forgotten that those were her people. She had forgotten her roots. Amen? So Mordecai had to remind her. He had to remind her that just because she is queen, she wasn't exempt from this new law, Haman's law. <coughs> Look with me in chapter 4, verse 12. It says, when Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are <coughs> in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Mordecai explains to her that her position is not by chance. As I said, God doesn't do anything by chance or on a whim. God has a purpose and a plan. There's much debate or some debate, excuse me, about this, this book of Esther. Some have said that Esther should not have been in the canonization of Scripture because it never mentions the name of God. It never says anything about prayer. Now, I 100% disagree with them. It should be in the canonization of Scripture because from the beginning of this book to the end, the providential hand of God is all over it. In this chapter alone, chapter 4, the providential hand of God is evident here. Look, look, look at, at in verse 14. It says, he said, to, he said to Esther, he said, For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. Mordecai was confident that they had the favor of God. That if God didn't use Esther, if she choose to, to not do what she's called to do, then God's going to work it out some other way. But he presents to her this dilemma. What, what, if, what if this is the opportunity you were born for? You ever look at your life and, and think when an opportunity arises, maybe when you're presented with the opportunity to share your faith with someone, what if this, what if this is the opportunity for which I was born? You know, somebody witnessed a Billy Graham. I don't know who it was. I don't know who shared Christ with him. But what if they didn't? God would have sent somebody else. But look at the opportunity that would be missed there. To be able to say, I shared Christ with Billy Graham. That's Kairos. That's a moment, a pause in the timeline. Amen? What if you were put here for such a time as this, Mordecai tells her. Esther was presented with the opportunity to be an advocate for her people. To do something that only she could do. Amen? You remember last week I told you that, that we should be thankful for those who are brave enough to be honest with us? Mordecai was that for Esther. He was brave enough to be honest. He was brave enough to present her with the truth. To present her with an opportunity. Do you not realize where you are and that God put you there out of all of these young ladies? Do you not realize the opportunity that's been given to you? It, he made it real for her. Amen? She needed to realize her position was not given to her because she earned it or deserved it. She wasn't entitled to this position. It was the providential hand of God that put her there. When you think about your life, understand no matter the circumstances you're in, it's the providential hand of God that puts you there. Amen? Even in the hard times. 
Even in the times when it seems like uh, things are just fixing to go plumb the pot, you know? The, the, the whole race of the Jewish people are about to be annihilated from Persia. And God put her there for such a time as this, that moment. God wants us to honor him with the blessings in our lives, amen? She was blessed to be the queen. She was blessed to be royalty. She was blessed to live in that position. And God expects us to honor him with the blessings in our lives. Sometimes that means we have to be willing to let go of those blessings. We shouldn't hang on to our blessings so tightly that we miss the opportunities that he gives us. We miss out on what God's wanting us to do because we so like what we have. We so enjoy what we have. We hang on to it so tight our knuckles are white. Sometimes we have to be willing to give up those things. Amen? Esther had heard enough. She realized her purpose. She called the, the, the people to a fast. Although, uh, although prayer is not mentioned, as I said, in, 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 this, in this text, prayer was no doubt involved in this time of fasting. She said, I will go after three days of fasting. I'll go before the king. After three days. Now, this wasn't, a, 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 this wasn't fasting and praying for an alternate person. This was fasting and praying for strength, for favor, for God to go before her. Amen? In this fast we're in, in this time of prayer and fasting, we should be praying and fasting, not for God to send somebody else to do what he's called us to do, but for God to give us strength, for God to give us boldness, for God to give us confidence, for him to give us favor, and most importantly, for him to go before us. Jesus taught us that oftentimes when we face our enemy, the devil, we only have victory by prayer and fasting. That's what he told us. By prayer and fasting. That's why I so encourage you to fast during this time of prayer and fasting. Esther seized the opportunity before her, making the most of it, as Paul instructs us to do. Making the most of it. And she stood in the gap for the people advocating on their behalf, that spiritual light was opened, was, was, was turned on. And she realized, this is what I'm here for. And I'm going to do it. But I want God to go before me. I need his help. Esther knew clearly what her calling was. You know, you and I, the church of Christ, the body of Christ, also are calls to seize the opportunity. We are called to seize the opportunity, to stand in the gap for those who are lost, for those who are hurting, for the less fortunate. We, you, are their advocate. You are their advocate. You're the advocate for the lost. You're the advocate for the hurting. You're the advocate for those that are less fortunate, that are in need. We bear the responsibility of leading them to Christ. You know, I mentioned earlier, like throwing the piece of wood to a drowning man. Many times we do that. Here, I hope it helps. But what God's intention for us to do is to give them that piece of wood so they can hang on to it and help them to the shore. Amen? That's being an advocate. That's fulfilling the call of God on our lives as believers in Christ. Amen? To have concern for those that are hurting, that are lost. Introducing them to the advocate of their souls. Telling them about Jesus. Introducing them, leading them to Jesus like leading the drowning man to the shore. Jesus stood in the gap for you and I. Amen? He stood in the gap. He left his throne above. He become flesh. Amen? He, he lived in a fallen world and he took our sin upon himself to the cross. So that we could be forgiven. He is our advocate. He is our advocate. He stood in the gap. Amen. This story of Esther is a story of Jesus. It, 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 she is a type of Christ. Amen. In that it represents, it points us to Jesus because we see in this story. 
We see in this story Jesus laying his life down. It points us to that event. It points us to that event. Giving all of himself for those he loves. Esther was willing. She said, if I perish, I perish. She was willing to give all of herself for those she loves. Jesus told us that in order to gain life, we must be willing to lose it. In order to gain this this life that he has for us, this new creation in Christ, this, this new life, being born again, in order to gain that life, we must be willing to lose the previous life. Does that mean we need to die spiritually? Yes. Die to our old self so that we can live anew in him. Amen. Is all that you have and all that you enjoy so precious, so precious that you couldn't or wouldn't risk it? Because I'm going to tell you, to serve Christ, you risk it. You risk it. We don't face persecution here in our nation like others do, but we still risk it. Amen? Are you willing to give everything up for Him? Is everything that you have more important than your relationship with Christ? Or would you willingly walk away from everything for Him? If need be. I challenge you this morning to evaluate your life. To make the most of the opportunities God gives you in this life. Don't allow time. Chronos. Don't allow measured time to be your master. But live in the Kairos. Live in that moment in time to where time does not restrict you. When you say, I'm going to pray for you. And you're busy. You've got something to do. You've got places to be. Remember Kairos. And live in that moment. And stretch out your hand and pray. When someone's in need, someone's hurting, or someone's lost, and you find yourself in that opportunity, that chaos, not limited by measured time, be willing to live in that. Not only tell them about Jesus, but be concerned for their situation. Care about them. See if there's something you can do. If there's a way that you can help, live in the chaos. Amen? So many times, time holds us in slavery. Especially in this culture that we live in. We're so busy. We're so busy. I love that acronym. Busy means being under Satan's yoke. And many times, time is our master church let's live in the chaos let's seize the opportunities let's make the most of every opportunity amen let's pray father Lord, we just come to you this morning and we thank you for your word and i pray god that you help us god i pray that you help us to yes live in the moment to seize the opportunities lord help us to be sensitive to the holy spirit God, I thank you. I thank you that you sent your son, Jesus. That you sent him in that moment of time to take our sin. Now, Lord, I pray that you help us to be compassionate, to be empathetic. Lord, to represent you well, that we don't allow time to hold us captive but Lord help us to love one another you tell us in your word that the greatest commandment is to love you to love God but also to love people to love people as we love ourselves and Lord you know that we love ourselves and God I pray that you help us to love others to care for others to be concerned with others 
issues. Help us, Lord God, not to be stuck in our world, but, Lord God, to be empathetic of those that may live in a completely different world, in a different situation, Lord God. Help us to not be Christians that brush people off, but, Lord, to reach out a helping hand. Help us not be the Christians, Lord, that throw a, a plank to a drowning person. But, Lord, help us to get them to shore. Lord, help us to not be the Christians that simply say, I will pray. Or, or the Christians that simply say, Jesus loves you. Lord, help us to be the Christians that spend some time to share the gospel. Lord, help us to be like Philip that attaches ourselves, Lord God, to, to, the, to, the, to the chariot that the eunuch's in, Lord God. Help us to be like him, Lord God, to take the time to share the gospel, to say, do you understand what you're reading? Do you understand what you believe? How can they unless someone explains it? How can they unless someone lives it? Lord, I pray that you help us to explain it, that you help us to live it, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, that you develop in us a passion for those who don't know you, a passion for those who are less fortunate, a passion for those who are hurting God. Help us, Lord, to represent you well. Help us to be like you your precious name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you need prayer this morning, I know we're a little bit late, but if you need prayer this morning, I want to pray with you. Amen. I might have a cough, but I don't think I'm contagious. Hallelujah. And God, can, God's way more powerful than that anyway. Amen. He's way more powerful than that. We don't have to be afraid of getting sick. We don't have to be afraid of all of those things. We can just trust God. Amen? Hallelujah. So if you need prayer, I ask you to come. If you just want to come and pray, come and pray. Amen? Hallelujah. Just give God a moment. Let's live in the K-Ross. Soften my heart Break me apart I need you
may be weak, but he's not. Amen? He's not. And if we truly believe that the spirit of the living God dwells with inside of us, and he does, then we ain't weak either. Amen? Hallelujah. You're strong in him. Hallelujah. Let's stand as we close in a word of prayer. Praise the Lord. Justin, it's your birthday. Close us in a word of prayer.